Hello everyone and welcome to the garden and more importantly welcome to the annual ranunculus video. It's so nice to have you here. Um, I have been growing ranunculus for about 10 years now. Uh, wow, where does the time go? And I've also been growing ranunculus here on YouTube for uh, about five years now. I think this is my fifth season growing ranunculus here on YouTube. And uh, I have several other ranunculus videos. Um, I can link the, those in the cards here uh, in case you do want to check those out eventually or you've checked them out in the past. But um, I always seem to forget some kind of important information whenever I'm making these types of videos. So what I wanted to do in this video is just make a complete overview of everything I do to grow ranunculus. I want to make sure to include all of the little kind of nitty gritty details of the ranunculus growing and hopefully it helps somebody. I know when I first started growing it uh, there was pretty much no one who would readily help you um, you know help you learn how to grow it. Fortunately things have changed a little bit and there's a lot more people on the internet talking about how to grow things but um, I find sometimes that information isn't the most reliable, um, you know, just coming from someone who's done this probably a bajillion times, it feels like. Anyway, um, so you're going to be seeing footage from it, probably the last three years is the footage I'll use and different options for growing these. So without further ado, let's get on into this. First, I uh, want to talk about how you actually grow the ranunculus. What, like you grow them from corms. You don't grow them from seeds. These corms, they're kind of like little bulbs or little tubers. Um, you can see how they look. They look like these little gnarly looking octopus looking things. I've seen people describe them as kind of like a little bunch of bananas. Uh, you have these little legs that hang down and you have that crown at the top, that tall, that circular crown at the top. That's what's going to be uh, facing up when we plant, but we're not there yet. The first thing you really want to do is decide whether or not you want to plant these in the spring or plant these in the fall. Because planting time really is going to be the main factor in determining whether or not you're actually going to be successful with ranunculus plants. For reference, I am here in Kentucky. I am in zone 6B slash 7, okay? Uh, it should be noted that ranunculus are generally hardy to USDA zone 8, growing zone 8. So uh, these are outside of my hardiness zone for the winter time. Okay, so um, I, assume they, I assume that they behave as a perennial if you are in zone 8 and beyond. But here in my garden they don't. My winters get too cold. If I were to plant these ranunculus out in the winter without any protection, and I've tried it just for the sake of trying it, uh, what happens is they freeze and the bulbs freeze solid and those bulbs just turn to mush and rot away. So it really is important to know your growing zone and kind of devise a plan of when you're going to plant these. Now, the first season, the very first season that I grew ranunculus, get ready, this is story time, this might be a little bit long. But the very first season that I ever grew ranunculus here in my garden, I planted them in the spring. Um, I had planted them in the spring pretty much as soon as the soil could be worked. It was a little bit later because I did buy the corms locally, so it might have been early April, um, the first week of April that I planted these. And they grew. The plants did grow. Everything came up. But, but, um, they didn't start to flower until about the first week of June. And since I had gotten such a late start, the corms and the plants, the roots, didn't really have a very good chance to become established. They didn't have a strong root system. Uh, the weather was a little bit too warm. These should be noted that these really, really like cool weather. These are cool season blooming plants. They bloom in very early spring. They like cool weather. Here in my zone, um, it heats up so fast, you know. Um, May rolls around, it's in the 90s. It heats up very fast. They do not like that. Anyway, since I had planted these so late, they did bloom and it was kind of disappointing. They, you know, each corn made maybe one or two flowers and the flowers were tiny. They were so teeny tiny. The flowers were only the size of like a quarter and a dime. They were the smallest, saddest looking things I'd ever seen. And I knew that's not, I knew that that wasn't what ranunculus were supposed to look like. So I, so immediately I knew that I was doing something wrong and I had to kind of 
do a lot of trial and error to figure out how to get this right. So like I said, I knew that that period of establishment was going to be key. Um, fortunately at the time, I can't remember now, I had found some information about planting them in the fall, even in my growing zone, which I thought was really, really interesting because at the time I had no idea about hardy annuals. I hadn't learned about hardy annuals or experimented with them. Ranunculus were actually the very first thing that I had overwintered in my garden. So for me personally, I get the best results when I overwinter the ranunculus from a fall planting. Now, you might be confused. Wait, I thought you said they weren't hardy in your zone. Well, they're not. So what I have to do here in my yard is I have to use, um, I guess season extension techniques is what I describe it as. So basically what I do in the fall is I sprout the corms and then I plant them into either an unheated hoop house or a small low tunnel um, that stretches across the ground. And this provides the corms with enough protection uh, so that they are able to withstand my winter temperatures with a little help from me in the form of row covers and plastic and things like that. And uh, they stay green all winter. The foliage stays there. It's green, it's small and dense all winter long. And then once the, uh, the daylight is right, which we'll get into a little bit later, um, that's when they start to bud up and start to bloom in very early spring. Here in my yard, I can generally expect my ranunculus to begin blooming about the first week of April and continue throughout the entire month into May, sometimes into the middle of May. I know a lot of other people mention that they can get them to go through June. I personally can't hear. By the time June gets here, it's so hot. These things are just, they're done with it. They're like, no thanks, I'm done, I'm out of here. Uh, so these are a very dependable thing for me um, for early season flowers at uh, the same time, around the same time that tulips are blooming and along, around the same time that a lot of the daffodils are blooming as well. And uh, that's really helpful for flower arrangements and everything like that. So let's finally take a look at these corms and getting into actually growing these. I know that was a little bit long-winded. Okay, first, there, it's important to note that there are several different types of ranunculus available out there. Um, the first ones I ever grew were a dwarf type that I had found at the dollar store. Um, I, in most scenarios, places like the dollar store and all those like in real life stores that you visit probably aren't going to have ranunculus at the correct growing time. Uh, here in my zone, we often get them in spring. I'll see them in stores in spring and that's just simply too late. Uh, I, barely, I very, very rarely see them in fall here. It might be different where you live depending upon where you live. Anyway, so it's for that reason I always order online so that they are shipped at the correct time. As I mentioned, there are several different types. I grew a dwarf variety the first year. Most of the cheaper types are like a single flowered type that can be a little bit underwhelming. So if you're looking for these big double huge types like you're seeing here, uh, pay attention to what you are ordering. A lot of the um, a lot of the types are single, and people will email me like, "Why are my you know why aren't they big and fluffy?" And I'm just like, "It's just a type." Um, but getting to the other types, there are some cheaper versions of the double types that are very pretty, very beautiful, and there are uh, some more expensive types of corms when you start getting into like the Amandine and Labelle series of ranunculus as well as the Italian Elegance series and the Cloney series, which is uh, very fancy. I only have a few of those myself. Uh, so there definitely is a difference once you start getting into those different types. If you are starting out and you are growing for the first time, I wholeheartedly uh, suggest that you give it a try with the cheap ones first. This is what I did in my garden forever, like since the beginning. Um, whenever I, still even, whenever I am growing something new for the first time and I have pretty much no experience with it, I just go ahead and buy the cheapest packet of seed or the cheapest plants or the cheapest bulbs that I can find. Because even though some of these cheaper varieties might not be as nice and might not be as good for cut flowers and yada, 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 um, the experience will, the experience is well worth, well worth it because nothing is worse, trust me, I've had this happen than making a huge investment into something that's a little bit pricier that you really, really want. And then 
completely failing at it. I think in gardening, failure is one of those things that's just inevitable. I know that this will be controversial and somebody will dislike this video and leave me a mean comment. But I don't really see gardening so much as a talent. It's just, you know, a knowledge. And the, the more knowledge that you gain, the better you get at it just from experience and trial and error and everything else. So, uh, if you fail the first time at this, do not be frustrated. Lots of people fail at this. And um, it can be difficult depending upon your growing zone. Some, in some zones, it might be totally easy. Uh, but it can be a little bit tricky in your growing zone depending upon your zone. So, do not get discouraged. It's all about finding what technique works for you and what method works and what row covers work and um, just the right fit for your own garden. So these corms, I have read probably a thousand times on the internet uh, and even when I first began growing these myself, the corms need to be soaked. More specifically, even at one point I read that they needed to be soaked in aerated water which meant like having a fish tank bubbler or something or a running tap dripping into the water. Um, that seemed really just superfluous. And the first year I did it and I got great, um, I guess I'll call it germination. I mean sprouting the corn starting and grow. I'll call it germination just for the sake of this video because I'm not really sure what that's actually called when a bulb sprouts. Um, I had great results. But it seemed like a lot of work, just, you know, for my little yard here and a, a little tiny bag of corms, I'm going to put a, I'm going to aerate this water. It seemed like a lot of work. So the next season, I just soaked the corms and uh, turns out it didn't need aeration. I'm sure if you are soaking a lot of corms and you're soaking them for a long time, maybe this aeration point is something that's totally valid. But here in my backyard, I didn't need it. Um, all I did simply was soak these corms in water. A lot of sources I've seen suggest uh, soaking them up to like six to eight hours or even 12 hours. I do not do that. Maybe that's why I have the difference in uh, experience. To me, that seems like that is way, way, way too long to be soaking these delicate little corms. At most, I usually soak my ranunculus corms for about three hours if I'm going to soak them. And that is more than enough time for these little shriveled up, little dehydrated looking messes to turn into something that's big and plump and healthy and ready to grow. You can see the difference between soaking them and not soaking them before they're soaked. Uh, they're just these little dried up pieces. After they're soaked, they're nice and plump. They have absorbed that water. Everything is looking so incredibly good getting ready to grow. And you know what? I'll go ahead and tell y'all a secret. Uh, last year, I was so in a hurry to get these corms. Last year, everything was kind of delayed. You remember all the shipping was delayed and everybody was getting everything real late and it was just a big mess. Last year, um, I had gotten these corms kind of late and there was rain in the forecast and all this kind of stuff. And you know what? I didn't even soak them at all. I just got, I'll, just, I'll show you what I did in a second, but I didn't soak them at all. And every single one of them started to sprout and every single one of them did absolutely great. So at this point, I'm honestly not even sure if they need to be soaked as long as your conditions are nice and moist and, uh, you know, consistently moist. I'm not even sure if they need to be soaked, being totally honest. And that just goes to show that there's no one right way to do something. You know, it's okay to experiment and see what works for you because what works for me and what works for you might be completely and totally different and I respect that. So, so I really try not to get caught up in the way I'm supposed to do things because there's always a little uh, extra room for, you know, leeway. Now, in regards to actually starting these corms, okay, um, I am starting my corms, I usually start my corms around the first or second week of October. This is about two or three weeks before my uh, first frost date. I do like to start them before the first frost date just to make sure that they are growing a little bit before it gets too cold. And again, this date will depend on where you live. This is just my date that I personally use. It's totally pretty much arbitrary in the fact of um, it can change depending upon where you are. But the main reason that I choose to use this date is because during this time, the weather is absolutely ideal 
for starting these corms outdoors, okay? I have this small backyard. I have this tiny, teeny house that has no room in it. I do not have room for grow lights. I do not have room for, um, you know, different bags filled with corms and all this stuff that people do. However, I do have some space outside that I can spare for my ranunculus trays. Now, it is true that you can directly plant the ranunculus in the ground. That's what I did the first time I ever grew them, and some of them did grow. However, um, with a lot of bulbs, is there kind of more of an investment, and I like to have a lot more control over what's going on. And since I am planting these in the fall, my falls are very, very wet, and my soil is a very, very heavy clay. So, uh, for me, that's a good reason that I am going to plant them in trays first. This clay retains moisture, it seems, forever, especially when the weather is cool. So, the last thing I want is these corms sitting in kind of soggy soil with the weather being cool. If there's one thing that I've found that is one of the most annoying things in the garden that causes rot is cold temperatures and wet dirt. So, I want to avoid that to the best of my ability. You know, I want, I want the soil to be moist, but I don't want it to be sopping wet. So anyway, I plant up in trays because the outdoor temperature is just the right temperature. For these corms to sprout, ideally we want the daytime temperatures to be about 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And we want the nighttime temperatures to be about 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, this, again, this is just kind of a guideline. It can be warmer. It can be a little bit cooler. I don't like it to be too much cooler, but it can definitely be warmer. And, and I've still had really good results. Um, and, you know, the plants have still germinated, sprouted, whatever, grown really well with a little bit of variation in that temperature. It's not something written in stone. But those are the ideal temperatures for me here in my yard to get these corms growing very quickly too. No waiting. Um, usually about three days they'll start to sprout up depending upon how fresh the corms are and whether or not I soaked them or not. Um, usually about three to ten days is what I go for. There are other methods to sprout these corms which I'm sure you can find on other channels. Uh, there's tons of other channels now. I'm sure there are tons of great options. I have seen people kind of um, put all the corms into a bag with like peat or something like that. I've never tried that. Just um, this way is easiest for me. Um, so I can't comment on that. I try not to comment on things that I don't have experience with just because I know that there's so much misinformation out there from people who have never done something and they make a video about it and it confuses everybody. And then I get a bunch of confused people coming over here who have questions. Anyway, uh, to get these started, all I'm going to do is lay out my tray. I'm going to put some paper in the bottom of the tray. Usually I use like recycled newsprint or just whatever I have on hand. Just uh, avoid glossy papers and just know what kind of paper you're using basically. Uh, make sure it's safe for the garden. And I fill that up with a little bit of potting soil. And I put uh, my corms in, arrange my corms in there. Again, octopus legs down and just barely cover them. I don't even really have to cover them all the way. Sometimes I leave the top sticking out, um, that crown sticking out, and I can easily tell when they've started to sprout. Um, that's not a bad thing. You'll notice that I am using these open mesh trays. I just like using these personally because they are easier to plant than cell trays. I think they give more space. Things do not get root bound in here unless you leave them for a very, very long time. And I find that it's easier to transplant when you're not having to pop plants out of individual cells like that. Uh, this is my favorite way to do it. It's just, again, my own experience and what works for me. So it's all about finding what works for you. There's no really right or wrong way, I don't think. Once I have planted these corms in there and kind of covered them up with a little bit of soil, I generally do give them a, a quick water, one quick water, and then I do not water them until they start to sprout. The only way that I would water them before they start to sprout a second time is maybe if the weather is really, really unseasonably warm and the tray is almost completely dry, I would water them again, but generally just watering them once is more than enough. 
to uh, provide that moisture that they need to begin to sprout. Um, they do sprout rather quickly, as I said, and within about a week, one or two weeks, um, I noticed that these plants are sufficiently big enough to start planting in the garden, to transplant in the garden. Um, I usually get these transplanted in the garden before my first frost arrives uh, so that they've had plenty of time to, you know, adapt to their new planting location and things like that. Um, planting them is relatively simple. I do like to make sure that the bed that I plant them in has been very, very well amended. Usually I use like a nice finished compost. I don't usually put any fertilizer in the bed at this point or feed them at this point. Guys, even though I do want a lot of healthy root growth before the true arrival of winter, it seems like the compost is more than sufficient and I don't want to stimulate too much growth. Um, I should note that there is a very fine line between um, smaller plants uh, that are ready to overwinter and do really well overwintering and bigger plants that are overwintering. That's something that I ran into last season specifically is that we had a really warm December and as a result of that warm December, these first plantings of ranunculus grew into very, very large specimens in the low tunnel before um, the cold part of winter arrived. And they had much more trouble overwintering as large plants than they did as small plants. And um, this might just be in my head. This might just be something that I think I'm observing, but actually isn't true. I'm not sure, but it seems like smaller plants do overwinter more easily than the larger plants. In transplanting these ranunculus into the hoop house, in this case, uh, probably you'll see in this video or the low tunnel, um, what I use, I use this landscape barrier fabric. It's a weed fabric. This is the DeWitt weed fabric. I've had this weed fabric for six years now. A lot of people uh, get on me like, oh, you use so much plastic. I mean, I really use this stuff for a very long time and um, my plastic waste is actually a lot lower than it used to be. Anyway, um, I have this landscape barrier fabric. I have burned holes in it at roughly six inches apart, four to six inches apart. Uh, they're crammed in pretty close here. Again, this is one of those things I've seen videos where people are laying down templates and crawling around on the ground making perfect holes. Listen, it doesn't have to be perfect. I I know some people are just perfectionists, but whenever I burn these holes, I just just do it. You know, I just eyeball it, and the plants turn out fine. Um, I think so often a lot of people get caught up in how things have to be, you know, precise, but um, my holes are roughly four to six inches apart, and the plants are totally happy being that close together, give or take a little bit of space. And I, I'm just gonna transplant these. The main reason I use this weed barrier fabric is, of course, I have some rather invasive weeds here in my urban backyard. I have chickweed, I have a lot of bittercress, I have creeping charlie, which drives me crazy. And honestly, if I do not put this weed barrier down, it is going to be a giant mess in this hoop house by the end of um, the end of winter into spring. Especially over winter, the bittercress seems to love growing in the hoop house over the winter. Um, so that's the main reason there. And during the winter, I mean, the coldest parts of winter, wet and snow, it's really hard to get in here and to get motivated to weed out these flower beds. At least it is for me, speaking for myself. I very rarely weed just because I hate it. That's not the part of gardening that I like, so I just don't do it. I know that sounds terrible, but, um, you know, I'm not trying to be something I'm not. It's the truth. Anyway, once we get these ranunculus transplants in their growing site, planted in their growing location, uh, now comes the part where we pretty much just wait. During the fall, I may water these occasionally, but it's very, very uncommon that I water these plants simply because, as I mentioned, my fall is very, very wet for the most part. The temperatures are cool. And uh, we don't want to overwater these things. They can that can lead to rot, which is not good. Mildew and all kinds of different molds and stuff that we don't want here in the hoop house. Anyway, um, I actually leave the hoop house uncovered until it gets rather cool in the um, in the late fall, early winter. In general, the temperature range that I try to um, to maintain these ranunculus 
If it's between about 30 to 32, um, I won't even cover the ranunculus. They can handle that pretty easily. Um, sometimes large temperature swings can be problematic for them. So like if it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit and it drops down to 30 Fahrenheit, that might be a little bit problematic. I might put a cover on them just because it's such a quick and dramatic swing. But if the weather has been cool and it's going down to 30, I'm usually pretty confident that those will be okay even if there is a light frost. Um, if there is a freeze projected, so um, you know, anything down to about 28 degrees, I'll go ahead and put a lightweight row cover on them, a frost blanket over the top of them. Uh, this is especially true in early, um, early winter, I guess, is a, a good time to use frost blankets. Um, Usually I don't start putting the plastic over the hoop house or the row cover closing up the hoop house until temperatures get below about 28 degrees Fahrenheit at night um, simply because that just seems like that's the temperature range when you know leaves start to get damaged we start seeing a little bit of damage on the ranunculus and most importantly I really want to protect them from that damage from frost and freeze because you know we want to overwinter as many healthy plants and healthy leaves and everything as possible and we do want to keep these um, just nice and green because that's going to help them fight off things like aphids or you know the mildew that I mentioned earlier anything that could happen over the winter that's going to help them really um, power through that and resist that as well because um, during the winter, I'm, I'm a no spray guard. I don't spray anything anyway, but during the winter, I definitely wouldn't spray anything probably, uh, especially in the hoop house. Should also mention during the winter, I do not water the ranunculus at all. These receive no water. Um, usually it is more than enough moisture in the hoop house or in the low tunnel during the winter. Um, Again, this could vary depending upon where you live. If you live in a very dry climate, you might have to water these things all the time. Or if you've got a different soil type than me, it really is a matter of trial and error. But I personally do not water them. I especially do not water them if it's going to be below like 32 degrees. Definitely would not water them. Um, I can't honestly can't think of a scenario in which I would water them at that temperature. When I, when I first started growing these, one of the most kind of frustrating things was like, oh, well, I need plastic. Where am I going to get plastic? Uh, the greenhouse plastic that I see online is really expensive, and I don't actually have a greenhouse, so I don't really want to make the investment for that. What am I going to do? And uh, what I actually use is 6 mil like construction, opaque construction plastic that can be found at home improvement stores. Uh, the great thing about using this plastic is that they come in a wide range of sizes. So you can probably find a size that uh, fits your own little structure pretty cheaply, which is a good, um, you know, which is pretty good. And if you take care of this plastic well, and by that I mean like um, once you take it off the hoop house, take it inside and store it somewhere. Um, I've made these plastics last four years uh, before any kind of ripping or tearing started. So that's what I actually use on my hoop house and in my low tunnels here in my little backyard. So, uh, and if you uh, want to know more about my hoop house, my large hoop house, there actually is a video here on the channel about my large hoop house. I'll put a card to, about it some here in the, somewhere in this video. Uh, this hoop house was uh, about $200 and it's lasted me four seasons. And it probably would have lasted a lot more, but I ended up taking it down in preparation of like hopefully moving, who knows. But uh, it's been such a good investment and has worked so incredibly well for the purpose of overwintering plants here in my zone, overwintering ranunculus and hardy annuals and things like that. So, um, once you have planted these ranunculus, management of the ranunculus and temperature and everything like that is going to be the biggest concern. Now, that is going to take a little bit of effort, time and effort, from the gardener, which is me. Um, but I think the payoff is worth it, personally. I know some people don't really think the payoff is worth it, but I, I, I really, really do. I really love these ranunculus so much. Uh, so, uh, what I basically do is, during the winter, throughout the winter, I'm just monitoring uh, the weather and seeing what the lows are every night. Uh, seeing what the highs are during the day and deciding whether or not I am going to 
uh, open the hoop house completely or if I am going to um, close it completely or if there's snow coming am I going to have to watch for snow. Since this structure is a little bit delicate if it snows a lot I have to go out there and scrape it off so it doesn't collapse and break. Uh, again that's something this might not be a viable option if you get a lot of snow this hoop house. Um, low tunnels are also a really, really good choice. Uh, you can buy a low tunnel bender, a hoop bender from, uh, I got this one from Johnny's Seeds. Not a sponsor, just where, just where I bought it. And uh, this has been a game changer. I really, really liked the hoop house bender, these hoops, these conduit hoops that I was able to make. They're so easy and convenient for covering plants. Um, really a, a, good, a good investment for me here in my backyard. With these hoop houses and low tunnels, it's also important to take into account how well they warm. They warm up very, very, very well, okay? So if you have very little experiences with unheated hoop houses, um, on a sunny day, it's not uncommon for these things to uh, rise in temperature very very quickly and that's something to keep into account too because just like the ranunculus don't want to be too cold they don't want to be too hot either so even in the winter when say um you know it's 40 degrees or 38 degrees or something like that in the winter time if it's a bright sunny day i'm gonna have to go outside i'm gonna have to open up that hoop house and make sure that the air is flowing through the hoop house make sure the ranunculus aren't overheating and things like that and this is especially important in uh, very early spring or late winter when you kind of get those off days that are a little bit warmer. Um, it can just really overheat in there really, really quickly and the ranunculus can start looking wilty and like, oh, they hate it. Uh, so really just maintaining that temperature is going to be the number one priority. So once I finally make it to spring, I usually like to take off the row covers the days are consistently warmer sometimes I'll have to cover them at night usually and that will become a daily chore you know covering and uncovering just depending upon the temperature but most of my ranunculus I found really start to come into their stride and budding up when we finally get about 12 or 13 hours of daylight um, I usually won't see any any buds or anything before that time but once we get about 12 13 hours of daylight that's when they start budding up and it, the anticipation I get so incredibly excited I just can't even tell you when I start to see the first ranunculus buds um, you know starting to form there around that time often is also around the same time that I start seeing maybe things like um, the first aphids and things like that so that's something to watch out for as well which is kind of good timing because, um, you know, things like insects and different diseases can really get out of control in the hoop house. So that's something that um, during the growing season I'm going to be actively monitoring for as well and treating accordingly. Um, last year, or year before last, I actually had a lot of white mold in the hoop house that was problematic that I had to treat. Um, but otherwise, I generally don't run into too many problems. Uh, with the arrival of the warmer spring weather, that's when watering starts to also be kind of a thing uh, to pay attention to. It's also a good time when I first see the first buds that I start to consider adding a fertilizer if I'm going to add a fertilizer. I don't always, uh, I don't always fertilize the ranunculus, but when I do, um, I try to use one that really focuses on the bloom so we can get the best bloom period possible. Um, a lot. I have seen people use horizontal trellis netting to stake their ranunculus. I personally don't do that. Um, I find that the stems are very strong and have and have very, very little trouble supporting themselves. And, you know, I live somewhere that gets some pretty strong, severe storms and everything. So I don't think that is... So I can't really imagine that that would be necessary in very many places. A lot of people choose to keep their ranunculus kind of undercover in a row tunnel or like a hoop house or something like that um in like when it rains and things like that i personally don't i mean yes if you are growing them for cut flowers things like rain uh can definitely have a negative impact on the quality of the bloom even intense sun i, I would say can have that negative impact but i th i think it's minimal um you know mine get rained on all the time i just grow them open here 
uh, without any cover once they start blooming and um, you know they do fun. Once they start blooming here in my yard, generally the weather is very, very nice and it's very seldom that I have to cover the flowers after they've actually started blooming because of that shift in weather. However, I did have to cover them, I think it was last year, because we had a snowstorm, a surprise snowstorm, very late in the season and I had to cover them to make sure that the snow didn't just totally topple them down. Um, but even then, I'm not sure how it would have been without the cover. I hope that this is making sense. I hope this is helpful. I feel like in a lot of ways I'm just rambling on and on and on. So as I already mentioned, once these ranunculus flowers are in the bloom, there's really not much to do. There's not much maintenance left to do other than keep them watered and keep them happy. And of course, cut the flowers for cut flowers. It seems like the more cut flowers and more that I cut and take, the more I get. Um, each plant will produce, I think the, the general consensus is about 8 to 12 or 8 to 16 blooms or something like that. I've personally never ever counted them. Um, I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you on how many blooms, but I've never counted them. Uh, the size of the flower will depend a lot on how well the roots were established um, beforehand, um, fertilizing, how much water they've gotten, and just the type of ranunculus. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of those cheaper types, the flowers will be a lot smaller than, say, something like a clony grand pastel, which is huge. So uh, if your results are a little bit lackluster, just kind of take a step back and, you know, like, hmm, okay, let's think about this. And definitely don't be discouraged. Uh, the whole process of learning to grow these ranunculus is just trial and error and, you know, tweaking what you've already done and learning from uh, past experiences how to just truly get the best results possible. Despite the fact that the flowers will keep blooming once you've picked them, these aren't true cut and come again flowers like say something like, um, you know, a zinnia or something. They do have a definitive bloom period. And you will start to notice when that bloom period is almost over. Like I said, the plants will start looking a little rough. And the flowers, um, in most part, I've noticed, will greatly diminish in size and just start looking kind of just like, meh, whatever. And uh, for me, that generally happens around the middle of May here in my yard, maybe a little bit later. And that's when the arrival of about, you know, the 90 degree temperature starts to really set in. And that's when things just kind of go downhill in terms of quality. Uh, if you do leave the, them in the garden long enough, they will start to kind of uh, turn brown and yellow and die back on their own naturally. Now, this is the part where I'm a little bit unsure because um, they are perennials. Like I said, in up to zone 8, they are perennials. But here in my garden, growing them as a cut flower, I just treat them as an annual. I dig them up and plant new ranunculus again the following season. And the main reason for this is that I just don't have the space. Here in my yard, I am in a constant state of crop rotation from spring to summer and fall and just moving things around. So I personally don't have the space, so I generally pull them up and just throw them away. Um, if you are really motivated, you could probably dig them up and transplant into a pot and keep them or something like that. Or uh, you could probably even leave them in the garden. I've heard people leave them in the garden. They come back year after year, which I think is a great investment. Um, I've also heard that if your soil is too wet in the summertime, they could rot away a little bit. Uh, again, I do not have any experience with that, unfortunately. So. Um, I can't really speak to my own experiences about saving the corms and perennializing the corms. Hopefully, um, you, I'm sure that y'all have tons of experience down in the comments below. So hopefully, uh, if, if you're willing to share your own experiences about how you save your corms or if your corms behave as a perennial or if you do any kind of special treatment to your ranunculus in your own yard, if you could... Uh, tell me all about that. It would be greatly appreciated. I would appreciate that so much. I'm sure other people would as well because um, um, that's important. Anyway, uh, that is something I really, really want to explore in the future is trying to get my ranunculus to behave as a perennial. Uh, in doing so, it's important to note that some of the fancier varieties are uh, do have plant breeders' rights. I won't go into that. Uh, just because there seems like people always disagree about what that actually means. So uh, be sure, as with everything, do, do your own research first.
Make sure that you are smart and well-informed and can make your own decisions and know what's up. Uh, I think that's the best advice that anybody can give is just to uh, take personal responsibility for your garden, the things you plant and how you do them and whatnot. Anyway, uh, I hope I am not forgetting something. I feel like I'm forgetting something. I just know that I am. Every time I make one of these videos, I, I think I cover all the bases and it feels like I always end up forgetting something that's very, very important. I'm sure that you will let me know down in the comments below if I forget something that's very important about growing these. Um, I've tried my absolute best to make this the best ranunculus video on YouTube. I'm trying my really, my absolute best. I do appreciate you so, so incredibly much for watching and for making it to this point. Like, that's amazing that you made it to this point in the video. This is a really long one of me just rambling on and on about them. But I had to make it because, honestly, these were one of the first flower bulbs that I ever grew. I grew ranunculus. I tried to grow ranunculus before I had ever even grown my first tulip. This is one of, as soon as I saw them on the internet, I was like, oh, wow. Do you, have you ever seen this? I had never seen them. They were beautiful. I couldn't get enough. And to this day, here I am. I am still addicted to ranunculus. Who would have thought? So I did want to put this together and hopefully it's helpful to somebody uh, who has been drawn to ranunculus just like me. As always, all the links to um, all the, my stuff is down in the description below. There are links to the blog. Um, I haven't updated the blog in a while. I'm really working on it. I've been really busy. There are links to the blog. There's links to Instagram. Be sure to go over on Instagram and follow me on Instagram if you want. It's a... Uh, there's gardening stuff over there, but it's also just like goofy, just me being me stuff. So if you're interested in that, you're more than welcome to come on over and join in. And uh, links to Patreon and everything else. Uh, there's a garden planner down there. There's all kinds of stuff down there. Just check it out uh, if you want to support the channel. Thank you so, so incredibly much for watching this video. I genuinely mean it. If it wasn't for you, this would not be possible. And that means the world to me, you know? Um... It just, it really means the world to me. I can't, I can't put it into words. So thank you so, so much. I hope that you're having an incredible day. I hope your garden is growing great. And I hope it is so sunny and nice and warm wherever you are. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.